Hello everybody, I'm Bart Massey. Welcome to Computer Sound and Music. I want to talk today a little bit about converting between the world of voltages and the world of samples. I want to talk about analog to digital and digital to analog conversion and some of the issues there. This is going to be a very brief lecture, but hopefully it'll be informative. There's nothing here you desperately need to know to understand everything else, but I eh, thought it might be a thing you want to do. Hope everybody's safe out there. Let's get going with this. So we talked last time about PCM, pulse code modulation, in some detail. And it's worth remembering that one of the things about PCM is that it's an approximation. It's an approximation in time because we can only recover frequencies that are within the Nyquist limit. We're not sampling to arbitrarily high frequencies. More importantly, it's a quantization in amplitude because we're taking some finite and typically small representation of the space of amplitudes and quantizing to that. So if we look at our little picture with the samples, right, we don't know exactly what's going on here. We know it turns out from stuff we'll talk about next week, everything that's going on frequency wise to some degree within the frequency range. But if this signal varies real fast, we're never going to know. And we don't know exactly how high these samples are because we're going to quantize them into just a few bits. And so some accuracy will be lost. And uh, the third thing is that hardware is what it is. We assume that the sampling clock is actually very accurate and that when I say I'm saying it, sampling at 48,000 samples per second, I'm exactly sampling at 48,000 samples per second. It turns out if I'm a little off in that I'm actually sampling at 48,005 samples per second, all that's gonna happen is all the pitches are gonna be stretched slightly. I don't really care about that very much, although, if you're trying to play along with the orchestra with your piano, I promise you that you'll be sad if things get too far off the accurate frequencies. The more important concern is that I really want these to come in the same place. Your clock may have jitter, meaning that some samples are closer together than 48,000 per second, some are farther apart. And if that jitter gets bad enough, the audio can behave really strangely. In particular, it can act like there are transients and you'll start to hear really strange things in the audio. So that's an approximation, but it's the first two that are the biggies. And so that's the thing to keep in mind as we ask, well, suppose I have some samples and I wanna get a voltage out it's pretty clearly wrong to just spit this voltage out on the output because right here there's going to be these sharp impulses, first of all, which is not a thing you want in sound. If I, if I wait 1 48,000th of a second and then drop this value like this, you're going to hear it as sort of a tiny click if the drop's very far. And if those clicks run together at 48,000 per second, it's going to be noisy and unintelligible. I don't want to do that. Also, if I'm more clever about how I reconstruct, I can take advantage of that to actually undo some of my quantization losses here because I'm constrained, right, in how these signals can vary between time points to get these particular set of samples. And so I can actually get more accurate reconstruction by doing something more clever. So there's sort of two parts to this story. The first part, is that, and this is going to be a little electronics, you'll just have to bear with me. The first part is that I want to actually figure out what how to spit out a voltage corresponding to a given sample. And the second part is I'm going to do some analog filtering at the end to reconstruct a smooth voltage thing from that sample. So let's talk about the first part first, where I really do do this thing of just spitting out the samples as voltages. The classic dumb way to do this is something called an R2R ladder. And for those of you who don't know any electronics, you can tune out for just a second. But what we typically do, or you can try to follow along, this is what's called a voltage divider. And the interesting property of this voltage divider is that it 
because this resistor is twice as much as this resistor, I'm going to get out, essentially, if this bit is a 1, these are bits coming in from the computer on the top, these A's. Let me make this bigger so you can actually see it. These A's coming in at the top are bits coming out of the computer. And if this bit's a 1, then I'll get a voltage up, uh, out here that's half its value and its voltage. So if this is a 1 volt bit, this will give me half a volt. If this is a one volt bit, it has to flow not only through this resistor, but also through this resistor. And so I'll get a quarter volt added on here. If this is a one bit, same thing. And, and sort of, you know, the farther to the left this bit is, each, each time I move to the left a bit position, I have the amount of effect that that bit coming out of the computer has. Oh, that's great, because that's how binary works, right? So I take the lowest, least significant put bit put it clear out at the left of this ladder and this out at the right well this is a strange way to do it right i could also just build little voltage dividers for each one of these but the the nice thing about doing it this way is that it turns out that one way you can get a resistor of value 2r is to put two 1r resistors in sequence and so now you have a resistor of resistance r here a resistance of resistance r below it this is also a resistor of resistance R. Oh, so all these resistors can be the same. And by the same here, what you typically mean if you're doing this for Sirius is that they're all on the same piece of material. And so they're perfectly matched. And it's really important that they be perfectly matched because inaccuracies here sort of add up. And if you screw up these bits bad enough, low order bits can swamp higher order bits and then you get something gross so if you're going to try to build this at home get a great big resistor pack that has all the resistors made up cut out of the same chunk of material and they so they match perfectly a uh, typical resistance is here are pretty high because you typically have an amplifier here on the output so this might be kilo ohms or even tens of kilo ohms um so that's a pretty simple way to go from bits being spit out of the computer as digital voltages to an analog signal being spit out of the converter. Uh, the biggest advantage of it is that it's really stupidly fast. I can spit out these samples, you know, 48 kilohertz is nothing. 48,000 samples per second, I gotta catch myself, is nothing for a setup like this. On the other hand, it has super bad accuracy and sensitivity issues. The components have to be matched exactly. The voltages for each bit really have to be exactly the same. If you don't have those things, it's going to be bad. Also, it requires quite a lot of hardware. That's going to require 16 pins to output a 16-bit signal on your computer. And by the way, you probably have two of those 16-bit audio signals coming out of there. And that's no good and a common kludge honestly is to save four bits by only spinning out 12 the top 12 bits out of the 16 and ignoring the rest which it turns out is pretty tolerable but it's not as good as if you had all 16 out there uh i'd really like to have one pin per channel that would be better than 16 pins per channel and better even than 12 pins per channel and a classic way to do that is a thing called pulse width modulation. In pulse width modulation, what we do, oh, that's way overscaled, is we spit out, we vary the, we vary the amount of time that the wire is turned on based on how high we want the sample to go. And then we average that with an analog circuit that sort of takes the average. And so, and this, this diagram isn't really that great. What you typically do end up doing then is sort of making a smooth looking curve of discrete values by sort of averaging how long, you know, while this is on, this is ramping up. While this is on negative, this is ramping down. And so you get this thing that's jaggy, but looks a lot like a sine wave. And now you can filter that with analog hardware and get your smooth sine wave reconstructed. 
that's a really common approach as well. That's certainly a very, very common approach on microcontrollers, many of which don't even have digital to analog converters for real. They just have, internally, they just have pulse width modulation and you program it sort of by hand using the microcontroller's timers. The problems with that scheme are that, as you can see, the if your resolution isn't good here, if you're not if you're not putting these pulses pretty close together and modulating their width, then this is going to be a pretty jaggy approximation. You typically want output pulse rates for pulse width modulation to be many times the sample rate that you're putting out so that you can get a nice accurate thing. And or even if it's exactly the sample rate, the point is that the resolution of these, of the width of these is gonna be a thing. And so you really want, you're gonna need some fast clocks in these pulse width modulation circuits, but still it can be made to work. Uh, the danger is if you get it too jaggy, the, the analog circuits at the end that try to average everything will fail and you'll have a problem. And there's a million fancy methods for doing this. I don't really want to talk about all of them here because this isn't an audio electronics course, but if you're curious about it, I'm happy to talk with you later about more of that topic. It's a thing I know a tiny bit more about, or I'm happy to help you find resources to understand it. We also have to go the other way. We have to take a voltage on the wire and ADC it, convert it from analog, a voltage on the wire to digital, to, pull, to samples. And that turns out to be the hard direction because those two tricks I showed you of pulse width modulation and R2R ladder, they really don't work backwards. There's no very good way to just use them the other way around. And so the classic thing to do in that situation is to sort of do an approximation method where I use my digital to analog converter to try to approximate the voltage and then I use an analog comparator to check if my approximation is above or below the actual voltage I'm measuring and it turns out that if you have a fast DAC, a fast digital to analog converter and then you know you can do that comparison really fast and so it turns out that that loop is the most common plan and so you use whatever digital analog converters you have and you sort of turn them into analog to digital converters by doing this let's approximate the voltage thing so that's what i have to say about that it's not very much i would be happy to talk with you more about it the part i didn't talk about today also is the analog because it is completely analog is what's called the reconstruction filters once i have these digital approximations uh, you know voltage levels that are still discretized in some way I need to build some analog electronics that smooth that out into the audio or smooth that out, you know, yeah. So, yeah, on the output, there's reconstruction filters. On the input, there's band limiting filters. On the input, there's sample and holds, which are all things that we could talk about. That's really all I think you need to know about this. For the most part, in this course, you can assume that the samples coming in are reasonably close to as accurate as they can be and are at the sample rate they're promising the hardware promises they'll be at with very little jitter the, going the other way around you can assume they'll be output with very little jitter, jitter at the sample rate they're supposed to be output and pretty accurately turned into a voltage hope that helped hope everybody's staying safe out there and i will talk to you again soon